With me being such a dedicated fan of the Sega Saturn, one might assume I absolutely hated the Sony PlayStation. On the contrary, I actually really enjoyed Sony's first console, and still own quite a solid library of great games for it even now. The PlayStation wasn't initially on my radar at all in the early months of its Japanese launch. I of course read about it in the gaming magazines, but I was fully behind the Saturn, and that's where all my money went. It wasn't until the US launch in late 1995 that the device started to capture my attention. Sony had secured Mortal Kombat 3 exclusively, and stuff like Warhawk really looked spectacular. As the system matured and the library grew, it got some incredible classics that made that generation something special. And that's why I decided to do a video on my favorite games for the PlayStation, done in a top 10 format so you can see what I was playing and why I loved it. Even with the Saturn released, I still found time to enjoy this console. And with the help of many friends around me, we always found a way to score the newest releases and traded them regularly between us. While the Saturn and PlayStation shared many games during that period, you'll notice that this top 10 has very few titles that appeared on both. That means we'll be covering games you've never seen on my channel. So let's waste no more time and get right to it. We are going to start this roundup with a few honorable mentions that I just gotta include. These games were an important part of my PlayStation journey, and just missed the top 10 by the slimmest of margins. Mortal Kombat 3 was huge in the arcade for me and my buddies. We were glued to the bowling alley when it was launched, dropping countless credits in, learning all the moves and fatalities. When it was announced for the PlayStation, it was a huge reason why many of my friends went the Sony route. I don't think it's given the credit it deserves for helping the PlayStation establish its Western marketing hype. Warhawk was a beast that really made the early days of the PlayStation something special. Being able to roam around at your leisure, blowing up ships and bases looked spectacular. It was one of those games that made you quickly realize the PlayStation had some serious power under the hood. Final Fantasy VII was an experience like no other. Lovable characters and an epic story made this one of my favorites. I dumped enough time here to max the in-game clock, sharpening my skills and trying to defeat the dreaded weapons that roam the planet. There's a reason why the PlayStation was able to catch and pass the Saturn in Japan, and this right here was a huge part of that. I didn't think much of the first Tekken on the PlayStation. I thought it was kind of ugly and just didn't enjoy how it played. Boy did all that change with Tekken 2 and 3. These two games saw massive upgrades in visuals, gameplay, and content that just had you coming back for more. Tekken 3 particularly was a beauty and one of the finest looking PlayStation games produced. I love the feel of Virtual Fighter 2, but Tekken 3 had its own thing happening and Namco slammed it full of unlockables and extra content that really made it stand on its own. Our final honorable mention is Rage Racer, the Namco racing title that was part of the Ridge Racer series. I love the car customizations here, and the gameplay was pure arcade style bliss. Some choose R4 as the best, but Ridge Racer peaked right here for me on the PlayStation. 3, 2, 1, go! 3 laps to go! When Sony and Sega began their battle in the United States, I couldn't believe Sega Sports was nearly MIA as the first shots were fired. And the lack of an NFL product was truly unforgivable on the Saturn. Sony, the newcomer, was well aware how much sports titles made a difference in that market. And shortly after the PlayStation arrived, its NFL Game Day series was born. And what a hell of a start it was. It used a perspective similar to the Madden games and relied on a presentation that was bolstered by real NFL stadiums and a great looking graphics engine that was smooth and detailed. This opening volley went on to sell over a million units and gave way to an excellent sequel in Game Day 97, starting a series of NFL titles that did really well for years to come. 
It began right here, however, and this was a huge contributor to the PlayStation success in my region. With Sega offering nothing and Madden's next generation product missing that year, Sony absolutely wiped the floor with its competition in the sports arena. Sony had taken the sports crown from Sega literally overnight, and the hobby was forever changed. I was always a fan of aerial combat games, so when the 32-bit generation came along, I was stunned at how much the genre improved. I had really enjoyed the first air combat for the PlayStation, but when Part 2 showed up, I played it non-stop for weeks. Namco had taken the original concept and upgraded it substantially across the board. It looked better, had more options, and an impressive amount of mission variety. I really enjoyed that the game aimed for an arcade style to its gameplay, yet remained intense with scenarios that made you feel like you had a lot to do. When it was released in 1997, it was one of the best looking PlayStation games you could find. The draw distance was impressive, the detail was stunning, and it still looks damn good now. There were three of these on the PlayStation total, and I enjoyed them all, but it was part two here that always drew me in the most. Often on top 10 lists for the original PlayStation, you will see Final Fantasy VII as the de facto RPG experience. I'm not a hater, I actually enjoyed VII myself, but it was Final Fantasy IX that's my absolute favorite on this hardware. It starts out feeling so small, so insignificant, just a tiny cast and their problems. But then things escalate into world-changing chaos, and then you get to see what these characters are really made of. Spanning four CDs, this adventure is absolutely massive, and some incredible cinematic sequences pepper its unforgettable journey. You lose dear friends, but save the entire universe in the process. Similar to games like Skies of Arcadia, I was drawn to this because of the lovable characters that I really wanted to help see through to the end of their story. The gamut of emotions they put you through really make this game. You'll be amused, shocked, hurt, and even angry as things unfold. Like most Final Fantasies, the story is ludicrous in its overcomplexity, but you won't care a lick because the personalities keep it interesting. And that's why 9 will always be the best on this console. Up until Silent Hill, I can't say a video game ever really scared me. Sure, I had jumped a few times, like the dogs breaking the windows in Resident Evil, but I'm talking real dread here. Silent Hill was one hell of a spooky game. Right from the get-go, you felt uneasy, and the setting felt dangerous and macabre. But the worst is yet to come, because you lose your kid, are stalked by demons that take many terrifying forms, and are in a constant state of being lost and needing to solve puzzles. Silent Hill feels isolated and you always feel alone, exacerbating the sense of dread that weighs heavy on you the entire trip. Unlike games like Resident Evil at the time, this featured a fully 3D world that was mostly played from behind the player's back. That gave it a sense of being more advanced and the world felt more cohesive and dangerous. There were also multiple endings you could find, some resulting in terrible outcomes that made you want to immediately replay it so you could find a better solution. That leads to the ultimate question, can a better solution even be found in this gut-wrenching nightmare? <laughs>
Sometimes all you need is a good action game to play, and Twisted Metal 2 was one of the best. It improves upon the original with larger arenas, but still retains that same great gameplay. This was essentially a deathmatch between vehicles. Use guns, missiles, mines, and other weapons until all your enemies are destroyed. You had locations all over the globe, and there was even a two-player co-op mode. The crazed cast of combatants were a sight to behold, right down to each one's special move that could result in some crazy damage. While this did go on to see a few more entries, I'm shocked Sony didn't turn this into an online, multiplayer-focused event that still goes on today. It seems almost made for online communities with lots of personalization options. Either way, I really enjoyed Twisted Metal 2. How such a simple idea as cars and trucks shooting each other could end up being so fun and addictive was quite surprising. There have been other games like it, but none of them did it as well as this one. The Need for Speed had been an interesting journey by the time Part 3 was released. I liked the first one, didn't think much of the second, and then 3 changed everything. This time we got great tracks, the best lineup of cars, and the different modes and options were icing on the cake. You could race at night, in the snow and rain, and you always had to worry about the cops chasing you down. The little details meant the world, leaves kicking up as you blew down the road, Headlights blinding you around a sharp turn. Lightning streaking across the sky while the red and blue lights of the cops swirled all around you. It was a graphical showpiece in many ways, and on console, the only place you could play it was the PlayStation. The PC version was even better if you had a 3D accelerator card. I confess I always wanted to see the Saturn do this game because the original turned out so well on it, particularly those lighting effects. Either way, it was an unbelievably fun racer that rivaled any similar experience that generation. While many of the people I knew liked slowing down to 40 miles an hour to take turns in Gran Turismo, the real fun was trading pain at blazing speeds in the middle of a thunderstorm. At least it was for me. The Need for Speed series never got as great as this one right here. Resident Evil 2 was an event when it was released in 1998. Not just a simple sequel, it built upon the two playable characters idea from the first and created two separate scenarios that changed up the story a bit. How you played with one hero also affected how things went for the other. These little details added a ton of replayability, not to mention the fact that the setting got so much bigger. You were now trapped in a city, zombies and bioweapons everywhere with a damn nuclear bomb about to decimate everything. I poured so many hours into this trying to get my times down to as short as possible, unlocking additional weapons. It was also quite an improvement in regards to visuals. There were more variety in the enemies, more areas to explore, and even your wounds impacted your ability to get around. I always really dug the way you didn't get the real ending until you completed a full playback of each scenario. It gave the game a feeling of really fleshing out the story and the characters within it. It made Resident Evil 2 a must-play and easily one of my all-time favorites.
As the release date for Metal Gear Solid approached, you knew this was going to be something special. The media at the time wouldn't shut up about it and the demo disc you could get left you wanting so much more. I had played the Nintendo game Metal Gear and really enjoyed that, so I was all on board with this new 3D adventure. I couldn't have been happier with it either. The gameplay really was something new to me. You could choose to go in guns blazing, but of course, the real fun was using the environment and your items to remain hidden from the enemy. This sparked countless play sessions trying to perfect your route through the game without being seen very much. It felt so cool sneaking up on enemies and taking them out from the shadows. The story was batshit crazy too. The personalities were larger than life, and the situations were a mix of science fiction and your favorite spy movies. It even had some interesting twists that would shatter the fourth wall. The story would have you do real-world actions in order to move past certain parts of the game, or affect how your interactions went. It was so different from the other game types available at the time, and remains a standout as one of that generation's most unique experiences. You're pretty good. Just what I'd expect from the man with the same code as the boss. It's been a long time since I had such a good fight. But I'm just getting warmed up. What? My hand! <laughs> Two-dimensional games on the PlayStation weren't a rare thing, especially if you factor in the awesome Japanese library the console had. But when it comes to the best, I gotta go with Castlevania Symphony of the Night. This was a direct sequel to Dracula X Rondo of Blood for the PC Engine. Richter Belmont is missing, Maria is on the lookout for him, and the son of Dracula returns to undo his father's resurrection. This was a big change to the series that had mostly been straight-up action platformers. It was a throwback to Castlevania II's more open style of progression, but also incorporated RPG elements like leveling up your stats so you could live longer, do more damage, and had more magic. Like Part 2, you could also use different items and weapons to make yourself more effective. You had a degree of freedom to how you went about things. You could hit areas up in a different order, and there were two different maps available to explore. Bosses were huge, secrets were everywhere, and there were even multiple endings to find. A Castlevania wouldn't be complete without a playable Belmont, which opens up after you initially beat it. It really did show that two-dimensional games could still be every bit as deep, interesting, and as fun as the new 3D stuff. It was the kind of depth Sega should have been adding to its own games, especially considering its hardware was so adept at two-dimensional visuals. <laughs> Our number one entry is my most played PlayStation game by a mile. A game so addictive, I would play it time and time again to see the smallest change in the story and endings. Resident Evil wasn't the first game of its type I had been exposed to. I played Alone in the Dark quite a bit as well, but let's not mince words here. Resident Evil made that game look like an old shoe in comparison. This had two different characters with their own stories, jump scares, exploration, different endings, and one of the best atmospheres a 32-bit title ever had. No kidding, being locked in this spooky-ass mansion was only half the fun. You would end up in caves, genetics labs, and even a shark tank, if you can believe it. But the best part of this was how you could change the events in the story. Depending on your route and how you did things, you could see different scenarios play out. This also had an effect on how the NPCs responded to you. Sometimes these choices would change where they were in the house, and other times, you could actually get them killed. Like Part 2, I spent many a night shaving time off my journey, trying to get through this game as quickly as possible. Play well, and more costumes and weapons were at your disposal. 
Resident Evil was a triumph of game design that elevated video game horror titles to another level. It hit all the notes of an epic game experience during a huge technology shift, and it reinvigorated Capcom as a premier developer. Back in 1994, Sony was mostly an unknown commodity in the realm of console gaming. They had a few software-related ties, but there was a lot of speculation whether or not they could actually compete with the likes of Sega and Nintendo. Even I had my doubts, and in those early days, thought for sure they were looking at a number 3 position that generation. But then Sega comes out with the Saturn and completely ignores the games that made the Genesis great. And then Nintendo goes and releases a cartridge-based system with $70 games and limited third-party support. I mean, these two companies basically made it easy for Sony. That left the PlayStation to leave its mark on the industry in a pretty profound way. I think the shift to 3D polygons was inevitable, but Sony definitely helped usher in that a lot quicker. So much so, I feel it caught both Sega and Nintendo completely off guard. The PlayStation was powerful, it was priced right, and Sony made it all as third-party friendly as possible at the time. This combination of great business sense and capitalizing on their competitors' weaknesses sparked a fire that continues to burn to this very day, almost 30 years later. The PlayStation brand continues to be a pillar of the industry, and I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon. I can only imagine how regretful both Sega and Nintendo were once they realized the unstoppable force they helped create by not working directly with Sony. Kinda makes you wonder what that Nintendo Sony PlayStation could have been, or how that Sega Sony platform would have turned out. There's no doubt we'd be looking at a very different console industry today had they existed. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.